start this afternoon with the first two verses of number 18 in the appendix. Number 18 in the appendix, and anybody that knows me knows that somebody else is going to have to start it. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to talk about gardening. And so as we read the initial verses, keep your eye out to notice Anything that to you might have to do with gardening. We'll start in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, or food, Verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now chapter 2 and verse 6, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. Verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden in the eastward of in Eden, and there he put man whom he had created. Verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it, or to till it and guard it. The master gardener is God. We see as we go through the Word of God that God works with gardens that He has planted. 
And uh, you're part of his garden this afternoon, as we shall see. So God is a master gardener, and he, his very first words to man after he created him, that, that is, the words that are recorded for us, is he says to man, his creation, you're in my image, or he says to us, he tells us we're in the image of God, and so that means to be like, morally like, particularly, and uh, so he says to them who are to be morally like him in verse 28 of chapter 1, God blessed them and said, these are his first words, be fruitful. If you're going to have a garden, you want to have fruit, right? You don't just have a garden to produce weeds. What's that worth? The object of a garden, gardens have objects, and the object is to produce fruit. And so God says to you, the very first words he says in the whole of the word of God, where he addresses mankind personally, is be fruitful and uh, multiply. We had, in what we just read, five or six things that are necessary for a good garden, a proper garden. The first one that I want us to notice is in verse uh, 29 of chapter 1. Every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be. First thing is seeds. You're going to have a garden. You're going to have something that produces seeds. Uh, any, I, I can't profess to give any explanation of good physical gardens. <laughs> We're going to stick to the kind of gardens that are represented here, and I, I can't claim to be a farmer or know what kind of good seeds farmers use and the rest of that. But we recognize from the Word of God that if you're going to have a garden, one of the important components of your garden is to be the seeds that you plant in it. So that's a very first point. And it's an important one. We'll look at it more later. The second thing you need for a garden is light. You're not going to have a garden. Uh, some of you in this room have gar physical gardens. And you know that, we all know, whether we're any good as a gardener or not, that light is important for the development of the plant or the tree that's bearing the fruit. Another, God provided for the garden even before Adam and Eve were put in a garden for them to be responsible for uh, was the needed water. Last week I was where Dan Brown is in Illinois and uh, Dan was commenting as a farmer, a literal farmer, he wanted to plant his seed but he was holding off a little bit for whatever he was going to plant because the ground needed water. And uh, so water is an essential ingredient, and it's also nice to recognize that uh, some things in gardens only God can produce. We can't, apart from God, nobody, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, is going to have a garden in which you produce truly what's needed in terms of light and water. The uh, verse, chapter 2 and verse 8 again, another important activity in a garden is the Lord God planted. The Lord God planted. If you're going to have a garden, typically it starts out with ground, land, and in that land you choose a seed, and then you prepare the garden by tilling it or some other means for the purpose of planting something that's going to produce fruit for you. So gardens need somebody. They don't plant themselves. Gardens need someone to plant. And uh, 
In the first garden, God's the, it's God's garden. He does the planting. Later on, I'm going to tell you, you're a garden that has to plant. Whether you're an individual or a family, uh, you, there's planting that goes on. The other two items are found in verse 15. Uh, He gives man responsibility in connection with having put him in a garden which God himself had planted. And we find that we as gardeners have responsibilities given to us from God as to the gardens that we are responsible for. And so in verse 15 it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. What? What were his two responsibilities with respect to gardening? The first one was, as it says, to dress it and to keep it. Mr. Darby's translation says to till it and guard it. You can have earth, but if you're going to plant seed in the earth or a tree in it, You need to prepare the ground. Dan, when his comments on it, said, you know, if the ground is not broken up, if it gets too hard, and I put my seed in it, and there's no water, there's no way that the nutrients that are needed to feed that plant to make it grow will grow, and it will be unfruitful. I won't get a crop because the ground's hard. So God was saying to Adam, and this was before there was any sin, God's garden isn't a matter of simply doing something since there's sins. (laughs) Something happened to the garden after man sinned, which we didn't read, but I'll comment on. And that is when he did it, He said, now, Adam, you till that ground. You keep it nicely kept so that when the rain and the sunlight comes, (coughs) there can be a growing process that will produce the fruit. The other thing he said to Adam is, you need to guard it. You need to protect it. Because there are things that can come into the garden that spoil it so that there is no fruit, and that will result from from it. So he said, Adam, you also need to guard it. (coughs) Okay. After Adam sinned, that garden he got put out of. God didn't allow him to stay in that particular garden. There's reasons for it. We don't have time to go into them, but... There was reasons why he had to put Adam out of the first garden. But he also still had to garden. But he also said to him, now, Adam, when you work that land, there's going to be thorns and thistles. There's going to be things that will enter into your garden that will work to try to spoil it from producing any fruit. And uh, the gardens of our lives... We're, some of us, pretty familiar with uh, what comes into the garden. It so easily comes into the garden, is the thorns and thistles to spoil the production of fruit. I'm going to say we're only going to probably touch on the top little bit, but if you really have time and get interested in the subject, you'll find that Scripture is full of illustrations that God gives to us based on gardening. But for our purposes in the time we have this afternoon, now we've been introduced to a garden and things that belong to it. Now let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 5, and we'll look at a next passage concerning the matter of gardening. Isaiah chapter 5. Here we have God, Jehovah, And it brings into us the Lord Jesus, as well as Jehovah, gardening. So we're going to see how God developed the garden and what's happened to it and what God did as a result. 
We'll read chapter 5, verse 1. Now I will sing unto my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. That was this type of garden, a vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. Notice the things repeat themselves. Maybe we need that repetition to get the points into our minds and hearts and consciences where necessary. But uh, he fenced it. The very first thing it said about his garden. He was going to protect it. He was going to set it apart so that it could be, as we have in, we've already read, a fruitful garden. So he says he fenced it. It was the land wasn't the best that he started with. So he says he gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine, best seed, if you will, that could be uh, the vine that he plants in his garden. He built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked at it that it should bring forth grapes. You got a garden? No doubt if your garden's growing this afternoon, when you get home, you're going to go out in the garden and see how it's growing. Is it developing the way you hope, the way you anticipate to have the fruit that you desire? So here it says he looked that it should bring forth grapes. He put out a lot of effort in his garden. And so what happens? He, it says, it brought forth wild grapes. That's a problem, isn't it? The desired object of the garden isn't being realized. Let's see why. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard? When I look that it should have brought forth, be bringing forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. He raised the question here. What more could I do? What more could I have done? So he says in verse 5, now go. I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge. I'm going to remove the guard. I'm going to remove the fence. I will take away the hedge. It, and yet the garden shall be eaten up. I'm going to break down the wall. And it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and I will not be, it will not be pruned nor digged. Can't read that word pruned without thinking of a personal instance in my life. I tried to garden multiple times in multiple ways, and I always liked grapes and tried to have grape vines to produce, and I never could figure out how to prune them right until I finally got a pruner by the name of Clarence Lundeen. And every time he visited, he had to go out and properly check out the vines and prune them because he understood he knew how to do it and as long as he was in my life we had good grapes uh, because of the work that he had the knowledge to do but here as it says uh, I will lay it waste it shall not be pruned or digged but there shall come up briars and thorns and I will command something else necessary the clouds that no rain be upon it for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts. Now here's the vine. Here's the vineyard. That Jehovah was had. He tells us what it is. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression. He looking for moral fruit from these people. And... Righteousness, but behold a cry. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Yeah, they had 
the people in his vineyard that his plants, they had their own agenda. It wasn't his, and it wasn't going to produce fruit for him, but sure, they wanted to have house to house. They wanted to have the land. As somebody told me once in farming that how much acreage is enough, and he said if you're doing it for yourself, always the farmer's field you'd like to have to add to your own. So your farm keeps getting bigger and bigger. There's no end, in other words, to the desire to have in the natural heart. And so he says, uh, verse 9, In mine ears saith the Lord of hosts of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. Put that in maybe a little bit today's vernacular. Um, An ephah is a quarter of a bushel. So ten acres to produce a quarter of a bushel of fruit. Do you think it's paying for itself? Is that farm worthwhile? Would you like to have ten acres of land that you're paying for and you're doing all the work and the seed and everything else and you get a quarter of a bushel of, of fruit or crop out of your land? The Lord says, well, that's what it's like in my vineyard that I have. Now, <clears throat> thanks, Joe. Now, the, what's the point of this story? It's not a story. What's the point of this, this chapter and this question, what more could be done to my vineyard, is considered by many very well-taught brothers to be the key question of the Old Testament. It's a very key question of the whole of the Old Testament that God planted a people in this earth that he was going to separate through that man we had this morning, Abraham. He was going to separate Abraham. He was going to take him to a land of fruitfulness. He was going to put his people in the land. He was going to put a fence, if you will, around the land. He was going to give them perfect everything of, if you will, the water of the word and the cultivation by the prophets and the teachers of the ground that was necessary to produce for God's pleasure a fruit. But it didn't. It didn't. The whole question of the Old Testament. And yet, this special people for God set apart His vineyard, His vine, No fruit. And so his result is, I'm going to take it down. At this point, I'm going to let it go. Because why? Why? We find out the answer in the New Testament. So let's, let's go to the New Testament, and we'll see why this particular wonderful best should have been the best garden in the world, didn't produce. Let's go over to John's Gospel, chapter 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12, and verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This really answers to the question, or it's the beginning of an answer to the question of why didn't my garden produce fruit? When you look at a garden that doesn't produce, probably one of the first things you have to consider is the seeds. Were the seeds good? If you don't have good seed, you're not going to get a good crop. I assume probably in the natural realm, billions of dollars have been spent to try to develop the very best seeds. 
for man's gardens, for corn and wheat and so on. And when it comes to planting, the planters are, by my imagination, out of sight expensive anymore because they're so sophisticated in order to plant very, very carefully the spacing, the contour of the land is taken into account, and a whole bunch of other things, whether it typically has more or less moisture, and sometimes the seed has to be adapted to, even within a field, to match, to produce. But what has to happen to a seed, regardless if there's to be a crop? It has to die. It has to die. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, that abideth alone. God wanted fruit. He didn't get it from sinful man. No matter how perfect he made the circumstances, no matter how carefully he worked with men, the children of Israel, it was fruitless. Because the vine, the people, were not a good seed. They were not a good seed. Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. So God put that aside. And in the New Testament, he tells us about a new seed. His son. His son. He's the seed. His son, this perfect man, perfect pleasure to God, as he alone, as a man, walked through this world, God saw all the fruit that his heart could ever desire in his son. The man who went about good, doing good to others, Healing, walking in righteousness and truth and love and peace. And God could look upon that and say, there, that pleases me. That's fruit. But the Lord Jesus, well knowing his mission here, his purpose here, why he had been sent, could say to his disciples, <clears throat> except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. That is, except I die for you at the cross and do the work there, there'll be no fruit. If that had not happened, I trust I'm saying this reverently, it was not the purpose of God, so it couldn't happen, but I'm just showing the natural end. In the Old Testament, there was no possible fruit for God. In the New Testament, if the Lord Jesus, the perfect seed, had not fallen into the ground and die, the only, can I say, alternative for God would be to destroy the earth and everything on it because it was going to be fruitless. But that perfect seed was planted in the ground of death. And then what? In that seed, it says, it bringeth forth much fruit. I'm looking at a room. It's not all finished fruit. But I'm looking at a room of the fruit of that seed. It's a joy. For me to look at you as you sit there and see you as a fruit produced from that seed. That one who went into the ground and died. <clears throat> we think we have time. We'll turn over to uh, 1 John chapter 3 to read a, a word in connection with this seed. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
First John chapter three and verse nine. If I can get to the right book of the Bible. First John chapter three and verse nine. That which is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You started your life born of Adam. You're part of Adam's race. You're part of a race that we read about in Isaiah that produces no fruit for God. Your life in Adam never produced and never will that which God can take lasting pleasure in. But the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ, the man who died and rose again, that, and of course, as we have in Genesis 1, those seeds that bore fruit, that fruit, in fact, every one, we didn't comment on it, but in, in uh, it said, Every herb producing seed. Every tree producing seed they could eat. To be fruitful and multiply has the sense that the tree that produces fruit is a tree that produces seed that can then be used to produce the next crop. And the Lord Jesus, the perfect seed, is the beginning But it produces a crop, and that crop bears a seed. The life of Christ in resurrection with the Spirit of God in them that can be used of God. And what does it say about it? What is the character of the life you have? You still have the Adam life until the Lord calls you to be with himself and you get that one's done. Because it doesn't produce fruit. But what is the character of the life that you now have? That which is born of God cannot sin. You have a life that cannot sin. The seed remains in it. The life of Christ, the perfect seed, remains in you. And... He is, who's the source of it? It's no longer here, born of Adam. It's born of God. And that which is born of God directly by this seed is eternal in its character as God is eternal. Now let's go over to John's Gospel again, chapter 15. See a little more about the matter of gardening. John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine. It's the Lord Jesus speaking. Israel had been a vine, unfruitful. God replaces it with a new vine, He puts that one aside. He starts with a new vine, the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. Now we have the picture, a slightly different view of it, but we know that if you have a tree planted in the ground or a vine planted in the ground, and it comes up, then from that stalk, You have your branches, and at the ends of the branches, you end up with the fruit. And so he says to them, as God's purpose was, I want you to be fruitful. He said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. But it's necessary, there's certain things necessary, so let's read uh, verses 6 to 11 about how the fruit gets formed and developed. If a man abide in me, he is, if a man abide not in me, whoops, I'll read verse uh, 5 over again. I'm the vine, ye are the branches. 
He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye abide In my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and your joy might be full. If you uh, go outside in one of these trees and you see a branch and you break the branch off from the tree, how much fruit is that branch going to produce? It's separated from the source of its life and its nourishment. And it'll produce nothing. God uses things that are pretty easy to understand to teach us spiritual things so that we can understand them as well. And he says, the Lord said, I'm the vine. But if you, he's speaking practically to them, we can never truly be separated from him, but we can in communion and in our walk. And he says, if you don't walk and abide in me, as or in a practical sense, if it was like if it was like you were broken off, how much fruit will there be in your life? There'll be none. No fruit. However, I think we have the character of some of the fruit that's looked for, uh, he, and the conditions of it. He says, verse nine, continue in my love. Did you walk? Have you been walking today in the conscious enjoyment of his love? That's one of the important things for the health of the plant, the health of the branch, is to enjoy consciously as the day goes on that I'm walking the day in the love of God. That is God's love for me. Not a question of how much I love God here. It's keeping in the enjoyment of God's love to me. Second thing he says Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, in this plant, fruit requires obedience, submission. And if you want to be a fruitful plant in your life, you're going to have to learn to walk in submission and obedience to the word of God. What's the result, though? Your joy might be full. Your joy might be full. Can you say you're a happy person? I don't mean waiting until you go to heaven. You know, it's pretty instructive, the first eight chapters of Romans. You get the teaching of how to be saved and why you need to be saved and being made the righteousness of God in him and so on. And there's a development of truth there. And you finally get to the point where the person being addressed, if you will, says, Oh, wretched man that I am. He's been taught all the truth. But he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. He's miserable. He's not walking in the joy that's described here. You have to learn some things that sometimes are pretty painful, whether you're young or if you're older and haven't learned them. But he gets, when he gets through that process, he says, the spirit of the life of Christ in Jesus has set me free. The spirit, the power of the life, it's a capital S, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That life that is that perfect seed. When that is enjoyed and learned, has set me free. And then there's the happiness of a joy of a life in fellowship with God. Okay. 
He also here, uh, one other important ingredient that's given in John's Gospel that we already have had, but just to look at it in chapter 4, in verse 13. There's a woman, she's not satisfied. Her life, she's miserable. She's thirsty. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, or if you do and you're not walking, abiding in Him, you're like the woman. There's, there's in you a thirst that's not satisfied. And she tried her hardest to find out how, how to be happy. But she recognized that she wasn't. And so she says to the Lord, who gets her alone, uh, in John here, chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, that was the physical water out of the well she'd come to draw from, uh, shall thirst again. But whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up, springing up unto life everlasting. Well, the woman says to him, Sir, give me this water. That's the water I want. You have in your hands the water of life. Did you uh, satisfy your morning thirst since you've been up? Did you spend time feeding on it? If you want to be happy, you'll learn to do it. If you want to enjoy fellowship with the Father and the Son, you need the Word. And you need it every day. Uh, probably 90-some percent of the people in this room will make sure you got three meals at least today. Do you ever go a day where you don't perhaps even have multiple meals of the Word? Get your physical ones. The Word of God is even more important in the long sense, long-term sense, than, than the physical side of it. Okay, let's go back over now to uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 6. Look not upon me, because I'm black. Because the sun hath looked upon me, my mother's children were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard have I not kept. Here's an unhappy person. Here's a person that had to look at their life and say, my own vineyard have I not kept. How are you doing on keeping the vineyard of your life? Are you allowing good seed? Are you taking in the water? Are you taking in the light? that gives understanding to your soul, that gives wisdom? Are you tilling the ground of your garden? Are you guarding it? A couple of days ago, in this connection, I think the Lord allowed it. It was of the Lord. I received an email from a brother in India, and in his email he had an attachment and I think that attachment was being sent to me so that the Lord would have it read to you this afternoon. I'm going to read it. It's from a daily calendar or a daily meditation. Yeah, it's from a daily calendar. The verse of that day was, For he that thinketh in his heart, so is he. I have a garden called my mind, which no one else can see. 
where it grows all kinds of things, all planted there by me. Before me lie two different sacks containing different seeds. The first is labeled spirit's fruit. The other, fleshly greed. Don't be fooled. God is not mocked. We reap what we sow. Though hidden there inside my mind, in time that fruit will show. It shows up my character, my words, my walk, my ways. Eventually the garden no one sees, my mind, it's hidden, work to be displayed. So tend that garden carefully, for thoughts are just like seeds. They'll either grow the Spirit's fruit or harmful, choking weeds. This I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. 2 Corinthians 9.6 We all need to tend our garden. May the Lord encourage us to tend it carefully. But then, just to go back to that verse in Song of Solomon, it says uh, in verse 5 or 6, They made me keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. It's the word to moms and dads. You not only have your garden, your heart, your life, but God has given you the responsibility to be a keeper of some plants in your garden that He has given to you, your children. Your children are a seed from God in the garden of your household that you are responsible to give the light, the water, the tilling of the ground, the guarding of it as responsible to the one who has put that seed in your, that plant for you. For you. It's yours. And it's your responsibility to work on behalf of God that what has been entrusted to you will bear fruit for God and for His glory. And ultimately, if the responsibility is carried out according to God's will, you, with God, will eternally enjoy the fruit. You will get to enjoy the fruit. You do certain things, and when this life's over, they're over. But that seed, that plant, in the desire and will of God is one that He wants to enjoy the fruit of it for eternity, and He wants you to share with Him in the enjoyment of that which He entrusted to you. But, as is in this verse, if you don't tend your own garden, you can't manage that one properly. It's important. You have to start with your own. And then, if it's taken care of, my own garden I have not kept. But if it is, then that responsibility as a garden keeper, we don't have time to turn to it, but in Matthew and in Luke, we have about the, the master that let out his garden, if you will, to people to keep it. 
And the day came when he returned and he looked at how well had they kept it. Had they kept it for him or had they used it for their own? God has given you means, spiritual and natural means, to care for what he has entrusted to you. And the day is coming when there will be an accounting, like there is in the parables, in the Gospels, as to how, was, how well was it taken care of. It's uh, something to think about, something to consider. We have, uh, I'd like to, uh, at this point, go to Romans chapter 13, or Romans chapter 11. Verse 16, Romans 11, verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So I'm told, people that are in gardening or farming for a living, uh, look for the first of their crop, the first fruit of their crop, and they look at it, and very often what they see gives them an indication of whether they're going to have a good season or not. Because it's an indication of what, the, what comes on after is going to be like. First fruit. What's God's first fruit from his garden? His son. His son. He's the perfect seed. He produces the fruit. But looked at in himself, if the first fruit be holy, then that which comes on will take its character. I enjoy it, put this way. God looks at his son as a man and in resurrection, and he says, I want everybody to be just like him. I want everybody to be just like him. God wants you to be like his son. That's the purpose of the end result of his work in gardening, is to make you so that you are the image of his son. No, you're not deity, but I'm speaking as a person. His son, as a man, is perfectly satisfying in the heart of God. And he's doing a gardening work so that the end result is that you'll be just like him. Pretty nice future. (laughs) But it's an ongoing work at this point. Okay, let's go over to Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. This was last week's Sunday school verse, I believe. Got partly my mind going in this direction. He shall see of the fruit. I'm sorry. He shall see the travail of his soul. Or Mr. Darby's translation. He shall see of the fruit of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. This is the most elevated way to say it, but can you imagine being in heaven and seeing the Lord Jesus look at you and everybody else and ask himself the question, was it worth it? That all that I went through in my life on earth and in my death 
And I see this. Is it, was it worth it? Can you imagine yourself being happy? No, I'm in heaven. There's no sin here. There is no lust here anymore in me. Everything is wonderful. My body's restored to a state of perfection. Would that satisfy you? I don't think so. But when you look in the face of the Lord Jesus, and you see him looking at you with perfect satisfaction and joy in the result of the travails of his soul, and see the joy of his satisfaction, your heart will be full to overflowing for eternity. Let's go back to number 18 in the appendix. Read verse 2. Maybe it'll have a little more meaning now than it did when we were, at least for this afternoon, a little more significance to you than when we started the meeting. Oh Jesus, Lord, who loved me like to thee? Fruit of thy work with thee, there to see thy glory, Lord, while endless ages roll. Myself, the prize and travail of thy soul. Let's read stanza or sings four and three and four. <laughs> 